All right, so while you're getting settled in there, take a look at the problem that's on the slide and figure out what tests that you should have for this function here. All right. Anyone have any idea what tests we should do for this? Sure, the back. asking if it's actually gray, it's mostly just saying are the, if you look at the code, it's saying is R, G, and B all the same as each other? So is this a gray scale value? Yeah. Is this a level of gray? Any other thoughts on what test we should have? Uh, when it's like zero to two, it should get false. Okay, that's one possibility. Can you need to test all the possible values for the and, uh, all possible true values? Yep. So you had parts of it, but this gentleman here has got it all. We need to test all possibilities. So the possibility where the first one evaluates to true, or the first one evaluates to false, but the second one could also evaluate to true, or it could evaluate to false. So we could do, now apparently I have written these check expects down incorrectly. <laughs> That's what happens when you write code in Google Spreadsheets at, you know, four in the morning. Uh, 
they're missing the what we're expecting it to be part. So just ignore that part. The test that we actually have here is I've got one test where the value is all the same. So 255, 255, 255. That's where both parts, both arguments of the end will evaluate to true. Then I have a test where uh, R is not equal to G, but G is equal to B. And I have a test for when R is equal to G, but G is not equal to B. So we've got four tests to represent all of the possibilities to the AND. Even though if the AND's first argument evaluates to false, it wouldn't even look at the other ones. I'm still going to test to make sure that's the case. And then because in my four tests to test the AND statement, I only actually used 0 and 255, I added one more test just to make sure that if the R, G, and B values are all different, that it still gives me the expected answer. Um, that test wasn't explicitly required. I just added it as an extra thing. The four previous ones are. So keep in mind that whenever you are doing these kinds of things, you have to make sure that you're testing all of the possibilities. Because you want to make sure that the behavior is exactly what you expect it to be. So, on that note, if you've got your clicker with you, I'm going to fire it up. And by the way, just as a general rule, I'm going to do the clicker stuff at the beginning of class so that we're not having to switch back and forth between it the rest of the day. So, fire it up. It's going to take me a minute because the software is really slow. Give me a second. It's not registering. Give me one more minute. There we go. So, yep. So I want to know how many tests do we need for this one here? Oh, I guess I should press start. <laughs> one of those days. I'll give you till one minute. By the way, if you're thinking, this doesn't make any sense, there's something tricky here. It's because there's something tricky here. All right. Anyone who hasn't got it in, get it in now. All right. So let's see what most of you said. There is a lot of people saying C and a lot of people saying D. There's a trick here. Yes, in most cases, we would need to test all possibilities. 
But there's something here that's not possible. I cannot have a number that is odd also be zero. So the answer is actually three. If I am odd, I am not zero. Therefore, there is no possible way to have an input for this little piece of code where you have true and true. Not possible. How would you write the test case? You can't. All right. Another one. Again, I'll give you a minute to think about it. All right, since I think you've all um, pushed a button on your things, the answer is true. It matters. Now, is it possible to write your questions? Or to have questions where the order doesn't matter? Yes, it is possible to have your questions uh, such that the order doesn't matter. But they tend to be a little bit more work and a little bit more evaluation steps than necessary. And in general, most people, how they write the questions, the order matters very, very much. If I have the questions, if x is less than 5, do this. If x is less than 2, do that. Guess what? 2 is always or one is always less than five, and so we will never enter the answer for if x is less than two. It matters, because we're going to evaluate the questions top down. Keep that in mind. One more. See how fast you can answer. All right. Conditional expressions do not have to have an else. This is true in racket. This is true in scheme. This is true in list. This is true in C and C++ and Java. You don't have to have an else. But if you can, it's usually a good idea. All right. So what I'd like to do is just a refresher of showing you little tricks uh, about the conditional expression. So I'm going to go over to Racket here. And uh, we're done with the clickers for now. You can put them away. So let's first write a conditional expression where um, we don't have an else. And this is a function that does nothing meaningful. So it we're not going to give it a meaningful name. We'll just call it magic. You might want to answer that. You never know if it's like Google calling you back. <laughs> All right. So if A is greater than or equal to B, otherwise, if A is less than B, We'll say goodbye. Very simple, right? Now we can run this and we would run a test. 
Remember that when you are running tests or writing tests for conditional expressions, you have to test both the boundaries and you have to have tests to make sure that you can enter each of the conditions. Because you never want to have a question and answer, one of these conditions, that never gets entered because that's a waste of code. It's a waste of time. So I can test here. I'm just going to do a couple quick ones. Let's make sure that uh, if A is less than B, it says goodbye. And uh, if A is greater than B, it says hello. And um, I'm also going to make sure that if A is equal to B, that it says hello. Great. Done. <coughs> the, this, however, is a little too complicated because there's only two possibilities. A is either greater than or equal to B, or it's less than B. Nothing else could be. So instead of having this expression checking if A is less than B, that's kind of useless. And having this code here is going to impact the performance of what we've written. It's going to slow it down. So we can improve the performance just a teeny tiny bit by taking this out and putting the else. So the code we had before, Proof that you don't need an else. But in this case, it would be a really good idea to have the else. So we can replace the question with an else. And if we run those same tests all over again, see, this is why you do the check expects, so you don't have to type it every time. Here, let's do that. Let's do it properly, right? Let's not be lazy. Make sure you get in the check expects that what you're comparing it to is the right thing, it's spelled right, right number. <coughs> there we go. Now we run. See? We got rid of an evaluation step by replacing that second expression, that second question with an else. When you are writing your code, don't anticipate that you can go straight to the simplified answer right away. Write what you can do and then go back and try to make it better. Refine your code. Don't give us the best answer first. Start with what you can do and then work on the refinement part. All right. Now, somebody asked me before, what happens if somebody gives you uh, some arguments and there are no questions in the conditional statement uh, that evaluate to true for it? Now, admittedly, this was a piece of code. I've never actually done that before because that would be silly logic. Um, but I ran it, and I will show you what happens. So we're going to switch this back to not using an else. And I'm going to get rid of that equal sign. Let's pretend that I forgot to put it there. So if A is equal to B, there's no question here that it will evaluate to true for. What does Racket do? Well, first off, you'll note that Racket's not complaining about this because there's no errors in the code. There's only errors in the logic. And we only find out about that when we run. And when I run it, I get one of the three test fails. Check expect encountered the following error instead of the expected value. Hello, con, all question results were false. So if you pass some argument into a function and every single conditional expression's question evaluates to false, Racket's going to give you the runtime error that you see here. There has to be at least one question answer true. Otherwise, you'll get this. All right. A couple other things to remember about conditional expressions. It's very common to think that the only place that a conditional expression can live is in the body of a function. That's an absolute uh, function definition. That's not true at all. You can pass conditional expressions as arguments into other functions as well. So if you want to have a conditional expression be one of your arguments to and, you can do that. Because remember that 
the functions in racket aren't going to be applied until the arguments are values. So the conditional expression would get evaluated, turned into a value, and then AND would be applied to that argument. So you can put them anywhere you want. And that's actually really, really neat. And it's pretty powerful. And it's something you can't do in other languages. This is something that's pretty unique to functional languages. All right, now we left off last class. Uh, we're in module four, and uh, we were looking at this tax problem. And I'll go back just so you can remember it. Where we are trying to write a function that's going to estimate how much taxes we're going to pay based on the income that we provide to the function. Now, in Canada, it's not so simple. If you make X amount of dollars, you pay Y amount of tax. Uh, we have this system where the amount of tax you pay, uh, well, it depends on which bracket you fall into. And then you pay some race rate based on your bracket plus some additional amount on top of that. So if you make between zero and 45,000, you pay only 15%. But if you make more than $45,000, you will still only pay 15% on the first 45,000. And then on the next 45,000, you will pay 20%. On the next 60,000, you're going to pay 25%, and so on and so forth. If you make more than 200,000, whatever you make that is over 200,000, you pay 35% on that. So we kind of get this piecewise linear tax rate. Now, the first thing that we need to do to implement this function is we need to figure out how do I implement the math for this function? And sometimes the easiest way to figure out the math is to actually start doing examples. And conveniently, as you start doing examples with a pen and paper, you also just wrote your black box test cases, which you're supposed to write before you write the function anyways. So we figured it out on some paper with some very basic numbers. You know, if I make 40,000, uh, since 40,000 is less than 45, I only pay 15%. If I make 60,000, then I pay 15% on 45,000 and 20% on the remainder. Similarly, if I pay $100,000, or if I was paid that, I pay 15% of the first 45,000, I pay 20% of the next 45,000, and I pay 25% on whatever's left over. We created some black box test cases, and what's interesting here is we also just saw, by doing the examples, what our formula needs to be. And from there, we were actually able to do things like make our contracts and define a purpose and all those lovely things. And yes, there is a typo here. There shouldn't be a backslash in the contract. That's bad. Uh, all right. Now, before we can write our function, what we realized is that, uh, and this is where we left off last class, was that, wait a minute, there's so many constants here. The tax rates themselves are constants. Why are they constants? Yes, they can change, and they do change year to year. But they're numbers that actually have meaning. And I want to make sure that next year, when I update this function, instead of finding and replacing magic numbers, I just update the constants. So I make the tax rates constant. Then I notice, oh, well, each bracket, the maximum salary for that bracket, that's a constant too. And that could change year to year, so I should make that constant. So we've made those into constants. Now, these constants are horribly named. BP1, BP2, what the hell is that? Nobody ever said that these slides have perfect style. I expect better style out of you than that. Why are they called BP1, BP2 in these slides? Uh, probably because there wasn't enough room in the slide to give them a better name. You'll find more often than not, if the slides are using bad style, it's because we ran out of space. Don't, don't do that yourself. Give them a meaningful name. You could say this is, you know, bracket one maximum value. There's lots of different names that you could use that are better than these. <laughs> now there's some other uh, constants that we can create. What we realized, going back to our examples, back here, was that the tax rate you pay is the base amount for the brackets below you plus whatever's left over. So if I make 60,000, I pay the maximum amount of taxes on the lower bracket, that is the 45,000, plus whatever's left over in my own bracket. 
And when I make 100,000, it's the maximum amount of tax taxes from the lowest bracket plus the maximum amount of taxes from the second bracket plus whatever is in the leftover from my own bracket. Those maximum amounts are base rates. If you make more than a particular bracket, then you pay the maximum base rate from the previous brackets. And that base rate per bracket could also be a constant because obviously we are reusing those calculations over and over again. See, we're calculating the base rate for bracket one twice. I'm probably going to calculate it for the second bracket twice or more depending on our inputs. So let's actually create a constant for each of the base rates. Lots of constants. Constants are a good thing, a really good thing. All right. Now I can write my function. Now this function has a requires that we put in here because obviously if you have negative income, well, I'm not sure how that works. You paid a company to work for them? I don't know. Maybe you want Facebook and Foray on your resume that bad that you would pay Facebook to work there. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to judge. If you pay a company to work there, you're not paying any tax. We're not going to deal with that situation. So we're going to require that our income is greater than or equal to zero. All right. So uh, what I have then is my, if my income is less than the first bracket's maximum, that means that I'm going to pay the rate for bracket one multiplied by my income. And if I am in bracket two, then I have the base rate for the first bracket plus whatever tax rate I pay for the leftovers in my own bracket. And then for bracket three, it's the base amount of taxes from the previous two brackets plus what's ever left over multiplied by my rate and so on and so forth. And this function works just fine, but it's ugly. I don't like it. The reason why I don't like it is because I am using the exact same expression, even though the arguments are different, I have the same expression being used over and over again. Base plus rate times the leftovers. Didn't matter what the base or the rate was, it's the same expression over and over. You know, anytime you see some repeated expression in your code, that's a really good example of when you actually want to create a function to do that work for you. Because you've used it one, two, three, four, five times in here. Maybe somebody else is going to use that, find that useful too. So we want to actually create a function to do this. Furthermore, what happens if Canada changes that formula ever so slightly? Do you want to change it in five places or do you want to change it in one place? You want to change it in one place. You should be working towards abstracting this kind of thing from your code, simplifying. So we create another function, and we give it a design recipe, because it needs a design recipe too. And yes, the function has a really bad name, but you know you can call it something better. And we're going to extract that fun expression, and we're going to put it in here. And now, instead of having the expression as the answer for each of my conditionals, I'm going to just call this function. And the advantage is it's, t it's not going to simplify our code. It can simplify your code, but it's making it so our code is more maintainable. Because now, instead of fixing the expression in five places, I only have to fix it in one. So now my code looks like this. What's furthermore interesting is my constants themselves use that expression too. So that function I just create, it didn't just simplify this, it simplified my constants too. That's great. And now if Canada changes the formulation, I just go back, I make one teeny change to this function I created and it affects my whole code. My whole code is not correct. Instead of changing it five or 10 times. That is great. When you are writing your code, if you find yourself repeating some expression over and over and over again, just passing it different arguments, that's a good indication to you that that expression should be abstracted into a separate function of its own. 
Now, we're not expecting you to do that off the top of your head, just knowing what extra functions you're going to need. This is a part of the code refinement process. You start with the solution you can get, and then go back and look at it and ask yourself, how can I simplify this? How can I make this code more maintainable? How can I make this code more readable? It's an iterative process. We're not expecting you to give us perfection after just sitting down, doing your design recipe, and barfing code onto the, onto the screen. Good code takes iteration. Now, in this course, those functions have a special name. They call them helper functions. It's just a function. Uh, if you go out in industry, if you talk to somebody outside of this course and you say, I'll just make a helper function for that. You say that in your interview for Google. That's what they're going to say. What the hell is a helper function? Is that like just a magical person come out of the computer and like help you? That's just something that is, uh, that's just terminology that's generally used in this course and a little bit in CS136. In the real world, it's just a function. All functions are helpers, aren't they? They're helping you do something. They're just functions. But in this course, we are going to refer to them as helper functions. You do need to have a design recipe for helper functions. I don't believe you have to have the full testing suite for the helper functions. But if you show up to me uh, with some code and your helper functions don't have tests, I'm going to ask you, how do you know your helper function works? And if you say, well, I tested, and you say, really? Because I don't see any tests. So even though helper functions don't explicitly require the tests, I highly recommend you do it anyways. Because how else can you be convinced that what the, you wrote actually works? Those tests aren't just, you know, some tick box on your grade sheet. Those tests are so that you are convinced that that code does exactly what you think it does. And how would you believe it otherwise if you didn't have those tests? So do tests anyway. All right, any questions about this? Yeah? Sorry, examples are tests. They are written in the same way. Um, examples should be non-trivial tests. Uh, generally speaking, you want your examples to be black box tests. So your examples that you give will count towards your tests, if that's what you're asking. Oh, okay. So, so if we have a lot of examples, then we don't have to have tests. So if you have a lot of examples, you don't have to have tests. Well, I only want for each function two examples. So if you give me 20, I'm going to look at you strangely. <laughs> All you have to do is take some of those examples and just shove them under the function, mm -hmm. and I've got tests. Okay? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. So to end off this uh, particular module, I want to talk about some different data types. So we've already talked about numbers. That's fairly straightforward. Everybody knows what a number is. Um, and we also have the data type Boolean, which just is true or false in Racket. So you've got the following types now. You've got num. You've got nat, and you've got int, and um, we also have bool. Yeah, that's not that interesting. There's lots more types. Uh, one of the rather unique types that Racket has is known as a symbol. And if you ask me what a symbol is, it's, I don't know what to tell you. It's a symbol. You can't do much with them, that's the truth. But they do have their purposes. So earlier in this module, we wrote a function that, um, given your grade in CS135, indicates which course you go into next. And we defined constants for 115, 116, 135, and 136. And so if you got less than 40%, you go into 115, so we produce 1. And if you got less uh, than 50, you go into 135 and so on and so forth. There's some rules regarding that. Okay. So you're telling me that I now have to look up what number matches which course? 
I don't want to do that. I don't want to figure out that 1 means 115, 2 means 116, 3 means 135. I would like the function to give me something that's understandable to a human and doesn't require me to read through all the code's documentation to figure out what the hell it is. We can use a symbol to do this. Now, a symbol doesn't have any kind of meaning um, to wrap it. It's just the name of the symbol has meaning to us. There's no number meaning to it. There's no letter meaning to it. It's just an identifier, a word, that is meaningful to us. And how we specify a symbol is by putting the single quote in front of a word. So I could do something like this. So let's open up bracket here. Let's get rid of this. And um, let's say I want to write a function that instead of saying true or false, this is a grayscale value, that is the red, green, and blue components are all the same, uh, it's going to say gray or not gray, or grayscale or not grayscale. So what I can do instead I'm going to produce, instead of producing true for yes, this is a grayscale value, I'm going to produce a symbol. The symbol only has meaning to human eyes. So I'm going to produce the symbol is grayscale. It has no text meaning to the computer. It has no numerical meaning. It is just a little thing. It's considered almost like a label. The label only has meaning to us. We can't do anything with it. It's just saying, hey, thing. So there we go. We've got our little function. And then I can pass into here. If I pass white, which is a grayscale value, instead of saying true or false, it actually prints out. The symbol is grayscale. And I read it, I'm like, oh, okay, it's grayscale. And on assignment two, you're going to use symbols where uh, you have the resistors, and the resistors have different colors, and the colors are symbols. It's so that a human can see the produced value and attach their own meaning to it. Like, oh, that's a yellow resistor. Oh, that's the one I need. And you go in your box and you grab a yellow resistor up. I mean, that assumes you have a box of resistors at home, which I'm going to assume you probably know, but maybe you do. So that's a symbol. Now, symbols are kind of funny. As I said, they don't really have a meaning, which is why they're kind of hard to talk about. Um, Racket does not assign them a number meaning. It doesn't assign them a string. It's just this arbitrary label that a human can read and attach value to. Um, so you can't add two symbols together. You can't multiply them together. You can't uh, say and is grayscale and is black because the symbols have no meaning in racket. Uh, the only thing that you can do with a symbol is you can define constants to have symbol values or you can test if two symbols are equal to each other. So I can check if a symbol red is equal to the symbol yellow, and it should return false. Now, you can't use the equal operator. You should not use the equal operator for two symbols because a symbol is not a number. And if we go into racket and we try it, which admittedly I've never actually tried this before, but let's give it a go. You'll see that equals doesn't work on two symbols because symbols are not numbers and the equals operator is for numbers not symbols you must use this type specific comparison operator so in this case we have the predicate c 
symbol equal question mark. And now it gives us the expected value. Right? So if you're sitting there wondering what is the equivalent to a symbol in C or Java, there isn't one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you might be thinking, oh, but what about enums? No, enums attach meaning to those uh, values or to them. So not even an enum is like symbol. Symbol's kind of unique to racket. Well, scheme and list. Uh, one last thing about symbols, by the way. Symbols are atoms. So remember that an atom is any simple value in racket. And yep, a symbol is a simple value. What else can we do? Well, what if I want to have my function produce something that's meaningful but actually has value that I can play with and do things with? Well, then instead of producing a symbol, maybe I want to produce a character or a string. Those are also types in rackets. So characters, we often think of them as something that we type, like a single letter that we are typing or a single letter or symbol that's printed on the screen. And that's a somewhat incomplete definition of a character. Um, certainly all of those things are characters. Letters, numbers, punctuation, white space, so a tab is a character. The new line is a character. A space is a character. And in fact, most people when they think of characters, they're thinking of something known as the ASCII table. So I will actually post this to Piazza, but uh, for those of you who are curious what an ASCII table is, a uh, long time ago we defined these characters to um, be 128 different single things, symbols. And it does include things like the numbers and the letters and white space and punctuation marks, but what's interesting about the ASCII table is not all of the characters that are out there um, are visible. For example, there's such a thing as the null token. It means nothing. And that's actually character zero. There's also something for um, backspace. When you do a backspace key, you don't see a backspace character, but it has a character representation. And all characters at least all ASCII characters, but this is also true of Unicode as well, have a corresponding integer value. And null is zero, and the backspace character is number eight. Now my personal favorite ASCII character is number seven. It prints nothing on the screen, but if you tell the computer, print me character number seven, your computer will beep. That's a fun one to play with. Number seven, makes your computer beat. If you're playing with number seven, make sure you either really hate the other people in the room or you're in a room by yourself. <laughs> All right. Now, the problem that with the ASCII table is it's very restricted. There's only 128 things, and it only corresponds to the English language. Uh, people very quickly did something known as the extended ASCII table, which not all systems support. Well, most systems support, but not all programming languages support it. The extended ASCII tables is another 128 uh, characters, which are different accents and funny symbols. So, you know, you've got the French accent, and uh, I'm not sure why we have an upside down question mark, but we have an upside down question mark. And we also have some little drawing primitives, which in the 80s, we use for video games. It's awesome. People would do ASCII video games with the extended ASCII thing. So like the walls of the castle would be these little pieces here, and then the monster in the castle would be like this is the snake, and there's the monster. <laughs> Sorry, one of my favorite games from the 80s is called Castle Adventure, and it's completely rendered with the extended ASCII table. It's awesome. And if you want to play it, uh, you can download it for free, I think legally actually, and you can play it on DOSBox, it's great. All right, so what if I'm not from France or a country that uses those particular symbols? What if I'm from Japan or some country that has its own alphabet? They would not be represented by this character set. So there is another character set out there, you've probably heard of it, it's Unicode. 
Unicode actually includes character sets from many different languages and countries. It has smiley faces that actually look nice and boxes and all kinds of other fun symbols. Um, all of these things, though, are all known as characters. Most of the time in the School of Computer Science, if you're working with characters, you're working with the base ASCII table. But if not, we would tell you. Um, what we're going to do with characters is on their own, they're somewhat useful. Like you might want to check, has the user pushed a particular key or something like that? But what we usually do with ASCII characters is we put them together to make a full string, i.e. a line of text. And that is also a type in Rapid, is a string. So a string is zero or more characters strung together. And I say zero or more because you're allowed to have an empty string. That's a, a string containing nothing. And you have a string of one character, you can also have a string of any number of characters. Now there's some different, you might think, well, a string and a symbol seem very similar to each other. Yeah, in some ways they are similar. I could have just as easily used a string to say you should go into CS135 instead of the symbol CS135. But the string is far more powerful because the string has meaning to wrap it. Each of those characters in the string has an integer value to Racket. Racket knows that, hey, C, uppercase C, has an integer value. I can compare strings together. I can append them together. I can check, are they equal? I can check if one is less than the other one. I can tear the string apart. I can replace the punctuation. Strings actually have meaning. It's a very, very powerful tool, where symbols have no meaning to wrap it. Another difference between a symbol and a string is we can't have white space in symbols. So it's literally just going to be just one solid thing. Whereas a string, I can have white space, I can have all kinds of things in it. Now, how do I make a string in Racket? Well, the same way you make a string in pretty much any language out there, and that is you're going to enclose your sequence of characters in the double quotes. So if you use the double quotes, congratulations, you have a string. A string in Racket is not an atom because it is compound data. It's not an atom. A character, on the other hand, is not compound data, so it is a simple value and it is an atom. Now, how do you do an individual character? It's kind of obvious how you make a string. How do you actually represent a character in Racket? Well, it's kind of ugly, and I never remember it because I don't use it in Racket. But how we represent characters in Racket is, I'm going to show you. I'm going to take a string, and I'm going to tear it apart. We're going to do, for a character, is pound backslash character. And I believe there's also another way of doing it. But um, well, let's just see if it works. Pound backslash 65. That's so just pound backslash and then the letter you want to represent. There is an alternate way to do the characters where you use the numbers, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. I'll, I'll post it to the other one. So this for a character and the double quotes for a string. Now, so that you can compare these to each other, I can check whether one string is greater than or less than enough to another string. So I can say, is ABC less than DEF? And it is. How is it doing that? How do we actually state that one string is less than another string? The characters have values. A has a value. I can look it right up here in the ASCII table. A is, for some reason I never remember the lowercase ones. I only remember the uppercase ones. Lowercase A is 97. Lowercase D is 100. So I'm going to compare the strings Character by character, looking at the actual 
integer representation of that character. So I can also do things like string equal. There's all kinds of things we can do. Strings are much, much, much more powerful than symbol is. Now, they say that we probably won't be using strings much in this course. Um, that's true. We don't tend to use them too much. Um, I like strings, so do expect that you will be seeing strings. All right. So, just going back here, see slides then. We have lots of different functions for strings. And there's just a small list of them here. There's string equal, less than, pen, length, uppercase, and there's a whole pile of them. If you are using strings, make sure you are using the functions that are designed to work on strings. You should always use the function for which this, uh, the arguments have that type. So I shouldn't try to use symbol equal on two strings because strings are not symbols. Obey the contract. Now, how do we represent these in our contract? You have SYM for symbol and STR for string. And then for character, char. Now, one last thing about symbols and strings. You might be thinking to yourself that strings are obviously always 100% better than symbols. Not quite. Testing for equality between two symbols is easy. Testing for equality between two strings is not easy. What's going on underneath in Racket is Racket is probably assigning each of the symbols that you create to a number. And then when you're testing for symbol equality, it just compares the two integers to each other. Simple, quick, and dirty evaluation. One operation. In order to compare equality for two strings, I actually have to compare equality of each character. So I check the first character. If they're equal, then I check the second characters. If the second characters are equal, I check the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And if my two strings are n characters long, then I have to do n comparisons for string equality. So testing for equality with symbols is much more efficient than testing for equality with strings. So if you have some situation where the only thing you're doing with the string is testing for equality, you might consider a symbol. It will be faster. All right. One last thing. So we've kind of pointed out to the fact that there are equality functions for each type. That is true. There's the equal operator for numbers. There's the symbol equal predicate for symbols. There's string equal predicate for strings. What if I don't know the type of my arguments? Or what if my arguments are of different types or maybe of different types? Is there an equality predicate for that? Yes. It's equal question mark. It works on anything, literally anything. So now you might be like, yeah, I'm going to write all my code. I'm going to get rid of the equals and all these type specific ones. And I'm just going to replace it with equal question mark. And technically speaking, that would work. But that's highly inefficient. And you're going to lose marks for that. You should only ever use the generic predicate equal question mark if the arguments could be anything. Or some type where there is no type specific equality operator already there. You should always use the type-specific one whenever you can. So don't overuse equals question mark. It is very, very slow. All right. Any questions about this stuff? Kind expressions, symbols, strings, characters. No, it's not. So to compare two strings, we don't sum the integers. 
values of the characters together because that would actually, there would be multiple strings that could sum to the same value. So what we actually do to do string comparison is we do a character by character comparison. Is it like? So character zero of string one compared to character zero of string two. So if we were to write that on the board, let's say I was comparing A, B, C to A, B, E. I'm going to compare these two first. And if they're equal, then I'll do these two. And if they're equal, then I do these two. Until I find one that doesn't match. And if they're not? Um, if they're not the same length, we stop. Because they're obviously not equal. Mm -hmm. uh, the very back, did you have a question? You answered it? All right, great. All right, any other questions? By the way, doing string comparisons, you'll be talking about that if you're in CS for many, many more courses. You'll even do proofs about it. All right, what I'd like to do then is move on to module five, which is on the course website, by the way. Oops, that's number six. We're not doing that. There we go. All right. So we're going to jump around a little bit in this section. And the reason why we're going to jump around in this section um, is we're actually working on making some major changes to it. and. Um, kind of working on that right now. All right, so we're going to take a break from looking at more racket syntax and more functionality. And we're going to stop and we're going to look at what exactly is a programming language? What does it do? What are the kinds of errors? Uh, and um, how do we assign meaning and how do we actually run programming languages? So to start out with, I want you to think about English. English is a natural language. It is a language that has evolved, uh, evolved naturally over time. And for those of you who speak it, you'll note that there are lots of rules in English. There are rules about how you put sentences together such that the person sitting beside you can understand what you're saying. So we've got rules about where capitalization goes. We've got rules about where punctuation goes. We've got rules about tense and all these lovely things grammar rules, but for all of the grammatical rules that we have for the English language, there are also a lot of ambiguities. For example, if I say this chicken is hot, that is a valid English sentence, but what does it mean? Some of you might interpret that sentence as this chicken is hot as in we just pulled it out of the oven and you're going to burn yourself if you try to eat it. Some of you might have interpreted that statement as this chicken is very spicy because you went to Lizzie's and got like 25 lines or something. Some of you might have interpreted yet another way. <laughs> and we won't judge, but maybe you had, you were describing this, oh, this chicken is somewhat attractive. <laughs> The problem with English and many human languages is that there's ambiguities. What if you were a computer and you said to the and you were trying to tell the computer that the chicken was hot? What meaning could the computer get out of the sentence this chicken is hot? The computer doesn't understand context. So if the previous sentences had said, I am making chicken in the oven. I put the chicken in the oven and now I have taken it out and it's describing the whole process. The computer can't interpret what you have written to figure out what the context of this chicken is hot is. It doesn't understand how to resolve ambiguities in a language like English. Which is why we don't program in English. Because there's so much ambiguities in what we could say that the computer can never figure out what the appropriate meaning is. Now that being said, if you would like to see the next best thing to English for programming, there are two languages you can look at. Uh, if you're old school, you can look at the language known as COBOL, which is like one of the few programming languages out there I haven't tried, which I really need to. Um, <laughs> it's supposed to be very, very difficult. Nobody uses it but anymore. Another language which is very modern and reads just like an essay written in English is called Inform 7. And Inform 7 is used to create these text-based adventures. 
So if you're looking for it, looking it up, it's in form seven. I've actually played around with it. I find it a little weird. And you actually write sentences to create these text-based games. It's, it's really neat. But in order to make that work, they had to actually specify which rules are permitted to prevent the ambiguities in the language. Computers need things to be specified very clearly. They cannot figure out ambiguities on their own. So languages for computers need to be specified without ambiguities. And they need to be specified very precisely. And this is actually a huge topic of computer science. So there are, uh, if you're in CS or you're interested in being in CS, there is, uh, you will continue talking about language development in CS 241. And then if you really like it as much as I do, which I do love it, uh, you can take CS 360 or 365. And then if you still really love it after that course, there's 462. There are people who research this topic. Um, it's, it's not a new thing. Now, again, I'm jumping around here. There are three things with the language specification that we actually need to consider. First is syntax. You've heard me say syntax error before. What does that mean? Syntax is how you write it down. A syntax error is an error with what you wrote down, i.e. you spelled something wrong. You forgot a closing brace. It's a problem with how you wrote it down. It's a sentence in English that you forgot to put a period at the end of. That's the first part. Then there is semantics, which is what is the meaning of the sentence that you wrote? Is the meaning of this chicken is hot? Is the chicken is spicy? Which again is also ambiguous. <laughs> or is the meaning of the sentence the chicken is temperature hot? So semantics is what meaning do you assign to the sentence? And the last thing that we have to consider when we're trying to create a programming language is um, how do we avoid ambiguities? We want to make sure that every sentence has only one meaning and one precise meaning. All right. So let's start to look at this. We're not going to go terribly deep into this. The first thing that we note is that um, if we were to write a language, a programming language, or even let's, let's invent a human language, there's this concept. Before we can talk about sentences, we have to talk about the words. How do we write? What are valid words in this language? The same is true for any programming language. What are valid words in the programming language? And in Racket, there is a way to specify valid words. So all of the built-in functions and any of the constants that we name or functions that we create, there are rules for how those identifiers, what they're called, must be written. So in Racket, which is like the world's most permissible language for this, you can have your functions or your constants named anything that doesn't include these symbols here or white space. Let me show you. I can create a constant named at, at, at. I can also create a constant. Oh, not that one, sorry. Because uh, if you have a comic book as well, it's not usually that word, but we'll let it be. Those are totally valid words in Racket. You can totally do that. You can't do that in C. You can't do that in Java. Nor should you. Don't name shit like this. Seriously? That's not readable, but Racket still allows it. So in Racket, our identifiers, that is the names we give to constants and the names we give to functions, have to follow those rules. It is any sequence of characters, not including white space. It never pops up the one I actually want. There's the one I want. Not including white space or any of those symbols there. 
So you can name things all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, how do we specify what makes a valid word in a language or an invalid word in the language? How would I write something that indicates very clearly what a valid idea is in this language? The answer is a regular expression. And this is something you'd learn in CS241. But a regular expression is used to check whether or not the identifier is a valid one or not. But what's interesting about regular expressions is while they're very powerful and they're very good at determining is this word or token valid, when it comes to putting the sentence together, they, they kind of fall apart. They're not good enough. We need something more. We have something more. And that's a grammar. So in English, we have a grammar that tells us things like um, sentence structure has the following format. So all languages have some grammar rules. There are grammar rules in programming languages. There's even grammar rules in film. This is actually something that I'm researching, is the arrangement of shots. The shots are the words. And the arrangements of shots are the sentences. And those sentences in a film actually have a grammar. And if you screw it up, the movie is totally unwatchable. Grammars are everywhere, not just in spoken language, but visual language and programming language. And the study of grammars, which we do a lot of in computer science, uh, actually stems from this individual named Noam Chomsky uh, in the 50s. <coughs> And we have been using his formal definition for grammars ever since. It's wonderful. Um, and by the way, you can like go on YouTube and watch some of his lectures. They're actually really, really great if you're curious. Uh, so yeah, Racket has a grammar. The grammar is telling us how do I put the words together to make a valid Racket program. Doesn't assign meaning to the program. It's saying, how do I put the pieces together to create a valid racket program? When I get a racket program, I want to be, or someone has written some racket, they think is racket, I use the grammar to validate, to make sure that the program that they have given me is valid. That's what I use this for. It's also how we learn the language because we can read the grammar and it tells us what order we have to put the symbols in in order to actually make a program that is valid. Now grammar rules, depending on what course you're in, depending on what text you're reading, they take different formats. I have already been showing you some grammar rules and I will probably continue to show you some grammar rules. It's whenever I want to show you something like, what is the form of a conned expression? I'll actually give you just the grammar for it. Um, because that's the easiest way to show you how to use it. So here's a couple of examples. One of them is from your text and one of them is not. For how do you define something? So if I want to create a definition, the textbook uses these angle brackets um, for anything that has another rule. So first off, we have the rule name on the left-hand side is def. And then we have bracket define, bracket that's the stuff that has to be present in exactly that format. And then in the angle brackets, we have bar, 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 dot, 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 bar, and it's some number of variables. And then there will be a rule for variable. And we've got expression for the body. There will be another grammar rule for expressions. So that's one way you can do it. The equivalent way, which is done in the actual bracket documentation, is this here. Definition equal to define id, 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 dot, 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 expression. Where we would have a grammar rule for id and a grammar rule for expression. That is grammar. And when I introduce new racket syntax to you, I usually actually show you one of the grammar rules for it. Because I think it's the easiest way to see it. Now, there are lots of proofs, lots of fun and crazy things that you can do with these particular grammars. There's lots of different types of grammars. There's context-sensitive grammars. There's context-free grammars. There's, it is a giant area of study in computer science. Um, they've listed some, but not all of the courses here. There's also uh, 365 and 462. 
and also 442 uh, are all going to have some of this topic in if you are interested in it. All right. So we've got a grammar for our language. We know how to write a program. But just because we can write something that obeys the rules doesn't mean it has any meaning. We now have to go back and assign some meaning to the rules. I need to assign meaning to the programs. And in Racket, actually what we're doing, our semantic model, is the substitution rules. If you see this line here, this is what you should do with it. It's telling us the meaning of a particular program. So one of the things I want to point out is that Racket does actually get evaluated the way we do these substitutions. And every step of Racket, even if we are doing it on paper, each subsequent step is still a valid Racket program. At no point do you get something in these substitution steps that is not a valid Racket program. So we're going to now go over some of the substitution rules. And I don't think we'll get through all of them today, but the last couple we'll do um, at the beginning of Thursday's class before we start module six. So the first one that we have, you've already been using. That first one is how do you do substitutions with built-in functions? Well. Here is the substitution rule, the meaning. So I have some function that operates on some number of variables, some number of arguments. So long as each of these arguments are values, then applying this function to these values should produce some other value. That happens in one step. It's a built-in function. We are not privy to the implementation of the function. Therefore, we can't actually step through the body of that function. So when you have a built-in function, you go from a function being applied to some arguments that are values to the answer in one step. Now, you'll note that we've used dot, dot, dot. Why are we using the dot, dot, dot here? Well. Some functions in Racket take one argument, some take two arguments. There's also functions like AND and OR and PLUS and MAX and MIN that can take any number of arguments. Do you honestly want to sit there with a pen and paper and write out all the possibilities? Because you can't. It would take you the age of the universe to do that. So instead, to represent a pattern, which you know this if you've ever done any math before, we just put a dot, dot, dot some number of repeated values. And it's all the same rule. Now this is different from what we would do if we were talking about a function that we wrote. If we have a function that we wrote, we have the implementation, which means that when we apply it to some values, we actually need to step through the body of the function and carry out each of the steps in turn. So the substitution rule here is a bit different. What we're going to do for a function that we have defined is if we have a function f applied to some values, we take in the first step, we're going to take the values and substitute them into the body of that function. So we're not going to go from what we've got here, term x, y, to the answer. We're going to go from term 2, 3 to the body of term with the arguments substituted in. That's one step. That's still a valid racket program, isn't it? It is. And so from there, now we can continue with substitution steps, and hey, those are built in. So I look at my built-ins, and it's like, okay, that one's a value, but that one's not. So I'll evaluate that one. I'm going to get uh, a square of 3. And then I have times 2, 9. And then I will do, oh, well, I'll move my arguments to times our value. So I multiply 9 by 2, and I get 18. And now we're done. Now, 
We've already seen it. You've already done this. All right. So there's the general substitution rule here. And uh, I think it's more valuable to you at this point not to memorize the substitution rule, but to actually just get practice using it. And of course, we've already done a few practice problems at the beginning of class. I'm also going to be probably uh, by this weekend posting some sample problems and solutions that include some substitution work as well. So you'll have lots of opportunities to practice this. There's also, by the way, on the course website, this thing called stepping problems, which I also recommend you get lots of practice doing uh, because they are actually going to have the computer check your steps and tell you whether you're doing it right or wrong. So you've got lots of opportunities to practice these. But, and there's more examples here in the notes, and I'm going to jump over this one and let you try it on your own. What about a constant? How do we do a constant? Because we haven't talked about that. Well, the substitution rule for a constant is you have to find ID bound. ID yields value. That's the substitution rule. Now, if we do an example of that, well, that only works if we're assigning ID to a value. What if I'm assigning it to an expression? So let's say I've already defined x to be 3, and now the line I want to evaluate is define y to be x plus 1. Well, what we would write is y yields, define x3, define y to be, and then we're trying to, in one step, we're going to substitute x <coughs> equals 3 into there. One step. And then we're still not simplified, so we're going to y yields define x3, define y4. Why do we go from here to here? Well, we're trying to turn y into a value. So we've got a value here, so now we say y yields define x3, define y4, 4. Oh, that's so ugly to write. So actually, what you should write instead of all this mess is just this here. Have the x definition at the top and leave it alone. It's done. It's over with. And then each time we'll only put the define y part as we're stepping through and simplifying it. And finally, at the very end, we'll just say y yields 4. And again, there should be some stepping problems on the course website to help you through with this. Yeah? So I have not this formula that when I do a like checking step in bracket and have the function after it. The program still work. And in this case, would it still work if I have to define y before x? If you try to define y before x, open up bracket and find out. So let's do that. Let's open bracket and find out if you do them in the other order. Well, let's just do defines here. So let's define y to be equal to, what is it? Uh, let's just say plus x1. Can't use it. Can't do it. And by the way, this is usually true in most languages as well. Uh, check expect is special. <laughs> Constants, however, have to be used in the order in which they are defined. All right. That is, we are out of time. So we'll look at conditional expression rules, and we'll look at and and or substitution rules, and then lists next day.